Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 738. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 24th, 2022. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. We know there's a lot of new uh, members in the audience, uh, in case you don't know. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm a layperson in the ACNA here in the shores of America. George is a priest in the Diocese of Central Florida in the Episcopal Church. And every week we sit down, or sometimes twice a week if we're lucky, sit down and talk about the news that's going on in our country and around the world. We really hope most of it's Anglican because, well, by the title, we're Anglican Unscripted. A lot of it's Christian, and sometimes we we delve into the stock market, we delve into gun laws, we delve into who knows what. And there's a lot going on in the world to delve into this week. And I don't know how long this episode is going to go, but when I woke up, well, I I didn't sleep well last night because, well, I, uh, you know, I was awaiting the the verdict from uh, uh, Roe v. Wade and to see what was going to happen and uh, uh, I've been anticipating some final judgment within my lifetime after 50 years and I'm a little older than 50 it's finally happened but we'll talk about that a little bit more Um, we talked in the past about some of our getting old problems George you've recently went to the doctor and now what's going on oh I went to the cardiologist this morning and uh, uh, I've got to have another procedure and uh, Oh, it's just the perils of being an old fat man. It, uh, <laughs> life catches up with you. It does. You got the <laughs> joints. You got your prostate. You got you know all these things to run through. You've got high blood pressure. All, yeah. You know, so I'm just making sure that uh, people are able to send their kids to college, buy new yep. boats. I'm doing my part to make sure we this country doesn't slip into recession. And, and same here, you know, I, I take my medications, I keep my doctor happy, even though I'm traveling on the road, um, he will find a blood drawing center for me like twice a year to get my blood taken. He goes, where are you now? Madison? All right, I'm faxing over orders for your blood draw. Okay, dang it, I thought he was going to get out this year, you know. Well, that's just part of getting old. George, let's move on to the news. Um, we're going to talk about the ruling from the Supreme Court. Uh this morning it was announced in a 6-3 to three decision that Roe v. Wade is unconstitutional. And it was a bad law from the start. Uh, it came up and has been tested many times in its 50 years of existence. And for many pro-lifers like myself, it's a sigh of relief. Oh, finally. But then there's a reality that has to set in. And that reality is... Um, 50% of this nation thinks there should be easy access to abortion and that it's not just going to all of a sudden go away and this doesn't make abortion legal this puts abortion back into the control of the states um, and, and the people who uh, are, are the populace of the state to, to control through votes and so um, this doesn't end that but I, I always look at this in my mind's eye like slavery when slavery was uh, overturned or uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was given by Abraham Lincoln, it took a generation, a whole generation, for the, the entire nation to finally say, yeah, okay, slavery is bad. And there's really no excuse for slavery. And that didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen within weeks. It didn't happen in the summer of 1963, 1863, sorry. It took a long time for that to... to uh, to become part of the ethos that makes the United States of America, that we understand to bondage somebody in slavery is wrong, evil, and sinful. Back in 1863, the South thought, you know, for economic reasons, we really, really need to have slaves here. And the North said, no, it's a sin. And there was this this climatic, growing concern, how are we going to deal with this? And it ended up we had a, a, a civil war over it. I don't know what's going to pretend here uh, over the abortion, but this summer you're going to see a lot of violence. And I do not recommend pro-lifers go out there and celebrate in the streets. I recommend you figure out a way to state the obvious, as George Orwell would say. We have to restate the obvious. And George, I don't know if you thought this would happen in our lifetime. 
I had doubted it, we're here. We now have to be able to minister to those who uh, have had abortions and are going to have shame for that. And we have to minister to those who uh, think that this is something that should be medically available to them. I expected Roe versus Wade as law to be overturned because the legal community, even most liberals, agree that the decision, the original decision, was bad law. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the late uh, Supreme Court Justice, noted liberal, supporter of abortion rights, was on the record many times saying this is a badly decided, badly argued case. So I was expecting the law to be overturned, but then something else put in its place to allow the status quo of abortion to be provided. So in, in essence, what the Supreme Court done, has done here is a double whammy. It's cleaned up one of the most badly decided decisions in its history, mm -hmm. as well as returned the topic of abortion to the states for action. Now, Kevin, I think you're right. I think in the North and in California and other uh, places where the populace is more pro-abortion, we will see continued violence against abortion clinics. Mm -hmm. I believe there since no, the not abortion leak, clinics against pro-life life, life yeah. pregnancy centers, pro-life centers, centers. Right. Pro -life centers. Mm -hmm. um, it, since the leak uh, earlier this year of the uh, draft decision, I think there have been 16 fire bombings of mm -hmm. pro-life clinics. I think there have been 16 assaults and uh, I th and just recently, the Department of Homeland Security has warned uh, pro-life pregnancy centers to be on guard in, in this case of this eventuality mm -hmm. so that they may protect their lives and property from uh, angry protesters. A little uh, uh, personal vignette. Uh, week, last week, I, uh, we have a pregnancy center in our community. We don't have an abortion a clinic in our uh, county. You have to go up to the University of Florida or down to Orlando um, for an abortion. But we have a pro-life center. And Father Frank Pravone of Priests for Life came to dedicate a new mobile clinic. And I was there and Father Frank and I dedicated a new bus. And we were talking about uh, the status of the pro-life movement. And one of the things Father Frank said is that there are five or six times more pro-life centers across the country than there are abortion clinics Absolutely. right now. That's correct, yes. And that the vast majority of work isn't just telling poor girls who got pregnant and don't know what to do, don't have an abortion. The vast majority of their time and their treasure is helping these people forward caring for them while they carry the child, helping them get their start you know, in life, uh, or if they wish to place their child for adoption, helping with that. One of the uh, things that people would smack uh, conservatives on this issue was, well, you just uh, want to control a woman's body. What happens when the baby's born? The straw man well, the best... argument, that, that, that's the ultimate straw man argument, is you only care about stopping the abortion. You don't care what happens after. And the, but the vast majority of time and expense of in the pro-life pregnancy centers are in this aftercare. Um, I'm encouraged because the change of the law doesn't change people's morality. Mm -hmm. But what will happen is that states like Florida will basically make restrict abortion uh, to cases of uh, you know the life of the mother or things of that nature. I mean traditional understandings of uh, when a moral choice, moral judgment has to be made. Abortion on demand up to the very last moment, that's gone in Florida, as in probably more than half of the states. But if you still want an abortion, you can go to New York, you can go to California, you can go to Vermont, where you can have New York and Vermont have states that essentially uh, support infanticide. Uh, if the baby comes out alive after a failed abortion, they can still kill it, and it's not a crime. Mm -hmm. um, so, but changing that is changing hearts and minds, uh, not just fiddling with the laws. Yeah, and I, fiddling with the law can always be the precursor to changing the minds as well. When we abolished slavery, 
it took a generation for the the, the mindset to fully come around as a nation. It took a, a civil war uh, for the mindset to come around as a nation. I hope that it doesn't take that to uh, change the heart of America now. I don't know. Uh, when I well, see what's happening in our schools with wokeism, when I see what's happening in our culture with uh, the aggressive movement of the LGBTQ community, when I see uh, uh, the flyers or the, the pride flag, this is Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, Stalingrad <laughs> of uh, CRT, critical race, and the pride movement. There are posters celebrating pride here that have women wearing strap on. Uh, I don't even know the name for it. Uh, strap on toys uh, and it, prominent pictures here in town. This is pride to us. Like, ooh, oh, no, whoa. <laughs> oh, slippery Kevin. has met slope. <laughs> you know, so. Oh, Demog Demography is destiny. Yes, right. It's just going to take time, mm -hmm. but the pro life people have more children because they don't abort them. Yes. Uh, they are they are winning the arguments morally and intellectually. If I look at the Episcopal Church, uh, Michael Curry just put out a statement saying he's very, very, very sad, deeply distressed by this ruling. Oh, that's a surprise. And the old Haridans and the old timers, the people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, old time feminists in the Episcopal Church, where this was their issue in the 70s, are going to be up in uproar. But you know, the Diocese of Central Florida has repudiated at, as a resolution, uh, by resolution at its diocesan convention many time, many years ago, uh, the fact that the Episcopal Church supports abortion. Um, and I just think that the movement is going to be in the right place. Those people well, are going to die off and they're going to be gone. And eventually you will see, I think our country, I hope my church, see and embrace the light of truth on this issue. And here's where we get to the light of truth. The light of truth, presiding Bishop Michael Curry, is the people affected by the abortion uh, industry the most are African Americans. Statistically, you have lost a generation and a half of young black people. That people group now, is the, gone. I see the figure 60 million tossed around. And I don't know if that's just the United States or worldwide. That is, the United era. States is between 60 and 70, depending on how you, how you count it out. Well, just friends, that's, if it's 60 million, that's 10 times the Holocaust. Yeah. That's almost the number of people who died in the Second World War. Yeah. Um, that's a hundred times the number of people who died in the American Civil War. Just think about that. Yeah. What, what carnage we've wrecked wreaked upon what, this nation what carnage we've wrecked with the best of intentions the supreme court uh 50 years ago said well we have to have some type of solution so they created a, a, two, a second trimester solution out of thin air and put it on the books and said this is now going to be the policy in the united states of america because the constitution protects it and this is how we justify it. Clearly, we discussed how badly the law was written, but we have lost 60 to 70 million people and their kids by now, almost grandkids. Yeah, they, we've lost kids and grandkids of these people who are aborted um, because we had good intentions. What I, what I find funny, uh, Michael Curry cites, you know, that the right found in the Constitution to abortion is uh, being trampled upon by the U.S. Supreme Court. Show it to me. And then earlier this week, he had a statement about the recent uh, New York State uh, Supreme Court ruling, U.S. Supreme Court ruling about New York State's uh, concealed carry weapon laws. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, this is wrong. It's unconstitutional. Well, if you read the U.S. Constitution, it says nothing about abortion, nothing to the right to privacy, but it has an amendment called the Second Amendment that specifically deals with the right to bear arms. Mm -hmm. So we're in a world, we're in a bizarre world where liberals can point to a non-existent language in the Constitution to defend abortion and then uh, ignore existing language in the Constitution to reject uh, the right to bear arms. Yeah, I, I, 
<laughs> I had my rant last week on, on uh, laws and stuff like that, and you guys were so generous in the comments. Nobody took me to task and see, I've been, you're wrong, 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 wrong. You guys were very generous, um, and uh, I hope you will be this week as well. Um, and in the comments this week, let's talk about where do we go from here? Abortion has not been outlawed. It has only been given to the states to decide. How do we minister to people who will still seek abortions? How do we minister to the 50% of people who think abortion should be something on demand? I don't think there's principally enough support at this point to make a federal law that would do it, but I've seen crazier. I've seen Ireland in the last 10 years change its abortion laws. And you would have think Ireland will never go. Well, guess what? Moloch rules there too. George, let's move on to the other news we got published. Let me check the outline here real quick. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is the fun one. So Lambeth 2022 is coming up soon. Uh, end of July, right? End of July. July. End of July. And they had a presser, and I was not able to attend, but George, via Zoom and uh, the, the technology of the day, was able to attend and ask some questions at the press conference they held this week. And... I don't know if you're famous or infamous, but they knew who you were. So let's talk a little bit about the questions that were asked and the tone of the press conference and, you know, what's going to happen, George? It was a three-hour press conference. First hour uh, was with staffers led by Gavin Drake, the head of communications, head of Anglican Communion News Service, where we went into sort of the background details. And in other words, we were given the agenda and all how 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 the day will look, and and that was where like I I picked up. I'm looking at the agenda. I said, "Well, I don't see any trip to Buckingham Palace this year." Mm-hmm. And they said, "Oh, well, actually, we're not going to be going to Buckingham Palace. We're going to be having tea at Lambeth Palace. We've invited the royals to come to Lambeth Palace, but it's past the garden party season, so we can't go to Buckingham Palace." So I had a little scoop there. Yeah. Okay, cool. right. And we, in other words, that the first hour was on that, those sort of statistical and procedural stuff. And a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, there are th- roughly a thousand Anglican bishops worldwide. And the Archbishop of Canterbury's intention is to invite all serving bishops. That's diocesan and suffragans. And the invitations have gone out but there are 300 from Uganda, Nigeria, Rwanda, and these are rough numbers, uh, who will not be coming. And they've known that for almost a year now, so they have planned accordingly. And so there are about 700 invitations out there where there may or may not be people coming. And at this stage, they have 658 people who have signed up bishops to come. And the Lambeth Conference uh, CEO, they've hired a businessman to run the show this time around. Very smart move. He's talking about profit and loss and covering expenses. I mean, this this guy knows what he's doing. Uh, Said that uh, roughly we'll have the same ratios and turnouts as we had in 2008. So Nigeria, Rwanda, Uganda are not coming as blocks. Some Kenyans won't come. Some Australians won't come. We have some people uh, who are, uh, for COVID reasons, can't come. Uh, so it looks like it'll be the same size as last time around. Well, uh, there's, people asked, who, there's people who won't come. Are the people who are not allowed to come? Yes. In 2008, there were four people who were not allowed to come, who were bona fide serving bishops in the Anglican Communion. Uh, the two were from Zimbabwe, Nolbert Kanonga mm-hmm. and Elston Jakazi. And those were the two crooks buddies of, Ro- of Robert Mugabe, who, uh, you know, just were bad Decimated guys. Zimbabwe, yes. Yeah. And the other two was the Bishop of New Hampshire, Gene Robinson, because he was gay, mm-hmm. and Martin Minns, a Church of Nigeria bishop, who cut, served ter- parishes in the United States, the start of what became... Uh, is now uh, a flourishing ministry of ACNA and its own standalone ministry. Well, I think Martin, Gene, and, Gene Robinson was not uninvited because he was gay. It's because he was living in a same-sex marriage. 
Correct. That's a better okay. way to. He was a non celibate. Okay. Right. Right. He was a partnered gay man. Mm -hmm. And I asked, is there anybody who's not coming this time with the decisions made at the Lambeth level, where those four guys who were not allowed to come last time? And they said, no, everybody's being an invitation. However, those bishops who are under discipline in their provinces will let the provinces tell us, don't ask this guy, he's on trial for you know, theft, embezzlement, uh, spiritual abuse, bullying. Mm -hmm. So there'll be some people who won't be there who are still bishops in name, uh, but have not yet been sort of formally pushed out the doors. Well, let me ask so, the 2022 question then. Do they have to provide a, a negative test COVID-wise before they arrive? That was not discussed. Oh. But I, I believe that, <laughs> but I believe British law, uh, Britain no longer has COVID restrictions, but I believe to enter the country when you get your visa. For instance, okay. the, the South Sudanese bishops, uh, you can't just hop on a plane from Juba and fly to London. Without a visa, they'll put you right back on it. All the South Sudanese bishops spent a day at the embassy in Juba. They all got their visas. They all showed their medical documents, everything. Their wives all got their things were done. So there's a lot of uh, preparation. And actually, I'm quite impressed with the work they've done. The procedural and uh, 2008, they ran a deficit. And after the conference was over, oops, we owe a quarter of a million dollars because nobody bothered to pay for the tent that we're using. This time around, they're going to charge uh, 49.50, 4,950 pounds. Uh, Phil George, who's the Lambeth Conference's chief executive, said the tickets are 49.50 and when he said tickets are 49.50 just a one we went <coughs> <laughs> we're not uh, selling anything here <laughs> and uh i asked the archbishop afterwards that were you having a digestion were you uh, fatigued <laughs> perhaps a cough coming on yeah. or did you not like the way that was phrased yeah. so that was the first part the second part uh just as he answered our questions which is the most Justin Wolby's ever given that I can remember an open-ended press conference. That's great though. And uh, Kevin, we Anglican unscripted Anglican were lucky because there are very few informed people there. The Times and the Tele and the Telegraph sent re had reporters present, but these were young people who asked questions that indicated they didn't know anything. Uh, the, the reporter from the Telegraph asked, "Well." If the Church of England is in such poor financial straits, why is it having this uh, jamboree? And Justin Welby said, well, it's not a Church of England event. You know, it's not paid for by the Church of England. Yeah, next question. Um, now, this is why Terry Mattingly so, is so famous, because the press just does not get religion. And, you know... He does, they, so yeah. they've got peeps... In other words, they don't have religion reporters anymore. Ruth yeah. Gladhill doesn't work for the Times. They know... Mm. Uh, really top flight religion reporters well there are but i they weren't there yeah uh so i was able to ask five six seven questions and i had a really good dialogue with justin welby asking i asked a few softballs letting him mm -hmm. tee him up okay. and i asked some um, when did you stop beating your wife questions sure uh what what for example uh the first question out of the bat that i asked him some of the people there think well why is this guy going down this line I asked, who's coming from Moscow? And I mentioned in 98, a man named, uh, who later became Patriarch Kirill was mm -hmm. the Russian rep. And Hilarion was the rep in 2008. Well, Kirill, who's now Patriarch, just filed, fired Hilarion. Kirill is under sanction by the British government. He can't come. The uh, British government and the Church of England has been really harsh on the Russian Orthodox Church. So will they have representatives here? And General Senate is going to debate a resolution calling for a negotiated settlement in the Ukraine war. And so I basically opened the door for Justin to sort of talk about that, how far, far he wanted to go. And so we had a bit of a scoop. It was Nick Baines, who's the Bishop of Leeds and the lead bishop on foreign affairs for the Church of England, released a paper Wednesday morning the morning of the press conference saying no decision has been made on whether or not Moscow is coming. And Justin Roby said, yes, they're coming, 
but we don't know who's coming and we it's don't know what level deputation is coming. Sure. Yeah. And we've invited the Ukrainians, the U Kiev Patriarchate of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church uh, to come. So we've invited Moscow and Kiev to send deputations to be part of this conference. So, I mean, that, that sort of opened the door and then we ask, and then I had my, when did you stop beating your wife question, where I asked him all about this change of correspondence between the three primates, Rwanda, Uganda, Nigeria, and he and Josiah Odawa Faron on the Lambeth Conference, why they're not coming. And I asked a question, which was pretty hard nosed, like saying, you know, they, in their June 10th letter said to you, stop virtue signaling. Stop, uh, you're just, you're using the motif of prayer to cover up endless prevarications. Right. What we do you say talk, about that? Yeah, we can't talk about these issues forever. At some point you have to buckle up. And here's the thing, Justin Welby spoke, I, my sense, and I've been doing this long enough, I know when people are reading cue cards. Mm -hmm. I know can't, I know when to put down my pencil and just snooze. Mm -hmm. And then I know when to pay close attention because Justin Welby was speaking from his heart and he was, I think, giving heart failure to his staffers because he's talking, at the start of the conference, you're supposed to introduce yourself and the publication you represent. And I was called first and Justin Welby said, oh no, George, you don't need to introduce you, it's yourself. Uh, I know who you are and where you're I from. I know who you are. No. And I said, is that good or bad? He said, oh, that's excellent. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Glad you could be with us. Uh, Okay. Well, Justin basically said, I'm glad they're being clear. I'm glad they're not beating around the bush mm -hmm. and sort of disguising their opinions uh, behind polite niceties. It's good that we hear these things frankly and firmly. And I want them to hear where I'm coming from and that I have a disagreement and it's based upon uh, my understanding of the Bible. The imperative that Jesus gives us in John, I think it was 17, to that uh, that we all may be one. The, so long the, the, as the Jesus either side, for unity, yes, absolutely. So long as either side celebrates Jesus as Lord, and yes, I know there's some Episcopal bishops who you can't really get them to say that, but so long as both sides celebrate Jesus as Lord, I think it's imperative that we talk and discuss and try to find a way through and he said i believe in prayer i believe in the efficacy of prayer i believe in the efficacy of conversation but i have a different understanding of how i read the scriptures and how i apply it in this case than do my three african brothers now that's the best answer justin has given to this issue that i've heard now he may have given it in other places but he gave it in a condensed version mm -hmm. and i can no longer say that the man's a pure puppet or hypocrite because no. I heard him speak from his faith position yeah. on an issue. I may not was, agree with it. It was an honest answer. And listen, when he does the BBC interviews and he does the Telegraph interviews, they don't ask him these type of hard questions. You know, they, they always give him the little, question, little questions or the one way out from left field, what if your kids were gay? What would you say to them? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a Telegraph type question. Here you have um, George Conger asking a tough question with follow-up questions. And I'm very pleased that uh, Archbishop Justin Welby took time to answer those. Uh, it's difficult to um, be in this type of context when you're trying to save Lambeth from itself and from the last bad Lambeth it just had uh, to be at a presser like this. And I'm glad you were able to ask and he was able to answer. Yeah. and. The, we got into the discussion of what are calls versus resolutions and what are you going to be doing all day? Mm -hmm. They are going to talk about human sexuality. They are going to talk about climate change. That some things I don't really think are ranked the same level uh, as others. But they're not going to have this, if, if I am to believe what I was told, this is not going to be as contrived and controlled as 2008. Mm -hmm. It's going, they want, they want to learn from their mistakes and have open and honest dialogue. And they, and they said, you know, look, we're calling these calls, not resolutions, because we realize that people who don't like what we say are going to ignore them. And if we call them resolutions, it basically sets us up for a fall. 
if we call them calls that you continue to dialogue with, you can come away disagreeing with the decision of the majority, but you can still remain in dialogue. So I have to, I have to give the I have to give the organizers, and Archbishop Welby, and even Josiah Dawufaron, who also knows who we are, Kevin, and doesn't like us, uh, with high marks because they appear to have learned from their mistakes, and they appear to try, and they seem genuine in what they hope to achieve. Now well, the problem no, I, is I, that I, there are different worldviews that are in, yeah, incompatible. Right. At this and so. I don't believe that they've learned from their mistakes, but to learn from their mistakes would be to repent from the mess of 2008 and say, okay, just talking about it doesn't work. We do have to, as a body of believers, have some skillful discussions and decisions on certain topics. And when the entire world wants you to make a proclamation about sexuality and um, uh, marriage, why can't the church stand up and say, we have teaching and understanding on both of those. Here's what it is. And when you run away from those issues like you did in 2008, you're dealing with a split church and you're going to deal with uh, a very tense Lambeth 2022. Um, I tossed him a softball. Hmm? Uh, wanting, you know, after, na after a nasty one... Uh, after you brush the batter off the plate, you want to toss one down the middle just to be nice. And I, and, and, but it was along these lines. Uh, the answer that I was trying to elicit from, uh, to draw from him, was on what you were raising, Kevin. And I said, you know, Archbishop, I, you seem to be frustrated that your message is not being heard by the uh, strange portions of the communion, and that you are being filtered by some of the people in this room when you talk to the wider Anglican world, meaning me uh, and you, Kevin, and some other people. In other words, they hear what we think about the thing and they don't really pay attention to Justin's words. And he said, you know, he, he paused and he looked down and he shook his head and he actually said, that's a very good question because I've never thought about it. Now, when he said that, you could see his aides going, oh, my God, what is he going to say? No. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be a Pope Francis said, moment. And he said, but it is what it is. You know, that's the reality. I would rather that we could have direct conversation. I don't like it when the press gets letters the same day I get them because mm -hmm. the press don't have layers of bureaucracy that by the time I get it, you've already got your stories out. But... He said, it's just the situation we're in is, and here's some great lines from Justin, the way the Anglicans argue. He said, some families scream and shout and argue in the front garden, which is the lawn. They, in other words, uh, from an American perspective, there are these people that shout and argue and wave their hands and make noise in, in restaurants, public. Yep. in public. And there are other people who hiss in the background. Don't want anybody to know, but they're just as loud, just as angry about their hissing. That's just the way we do it. And I, and he said, no, he was not going to identify who are the shouters and who are the hissers. But at least we're hearing the arguments he's saying. So he's trying to make lemonade out of lemons. And then he went on to say, because here he understood, I think what I think he picked up or I pricked his, pricked his thinking on this point because he went to where I wanted him to go. He said, you know, 10 years ago, I was talking to an Anglican primate he's, and this uh, from Africa, and this African primate said, you know, you English don't speak English. I mean, we don't, you don't understand each well. <laughs> You know, in our history, um, if an Englishman said to us, we don't entirely agree with you, we thought, well, that meant they don't entirely agree with us. But what it really meant was we're going to send a gunboat up the river and blow up your village. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, the cultural barriers, the language barriers, the worldview barriers are so difficult to overcome. And then when in between steps George and Kevin or the Episcopal News Service or other people, um, it almost makes it impossible to be heard. 
So what Justin Welby was doing, and I don't think he meant to say it this way, is that Lambeth, by gathering in person, hopefully we will be able to understand each other in a way that we can't through letters, through tweets, through Facebook posts, through talking heads like George and Kevin. Because um, one of the things, you know, we joke about Justin knows who he is. Well, somebody's watching us, Kevin, at Lambeth Palace. And either Justin is doing it. I don't think he has the time to watch every episode. Yeah, don't do that, Justin. Somebody, <laughs> but somebody is noting what we're saying because this man knows who we are. And who are we? You're a guy well, in a mobile in a trailer up in Madison, and I'm I'm a guy in here, in, a priest in Hooterville, Florida. Yeah. I, I, um, well, but he, here is that reality: we are addressing a broken church. You know, the the point of Anglican Scripted and Anglican TV Ministries and Anglican Dot Inc. is to encourage the body through transparent news, as unfiltered and as unbiased as we can put it out. Uh, many times the press releases from uh, provinces themselves, but that reality that you will never understand what's really happening if you can't understand the characters behind it, including the Justin Welby's, the Rowan Williams, the Archbishop Duncan's, and putting them on video is really the best way to uh, let you see if they're speaking from the heart, if they understand what they're talking about, if they're reading from a piece of paper that says, pause and breathe. You know, and so you, you want to be sure that um, you're encouraged and encouraging within the church. And when he calls for a Lambeth to draw people into fellowship, that's great. But he's doing that when it didn't work 10 years ago. 10 years ago, now, he, or well, the last Lambeth, he said, I, you know, the sin of schism is worse than the sin of uh, all other sins. Yeah, Rowan Williams. Uh, yeah. That was Rowan's line. Yeah. Um, now, people will come back to me and say, well, George, Justin is famous for speaking to tickle the ears of the audience he's before. When he goes to the Green Belt, he's, you know, really with it Southern. with the kids. Yeah. When he's talking to when he's talking to George Conger, he's real solid evangelical and, you know, this and that. Well, he didn't smack me down in this conference and most people like to smack the press down in conferences in press conferences he smacked down the church times which certainly wasn't for my benefit hmm. uh the reporter for the church time who's a bright intelligent great guy you know him he's on the liberal side of things it is the church times and he asked a question archbishop i really don't see why we need to have a spouse's conference this is a modern age. I mean, spouses have their own careers. They have their own work. Isn't this just an expensive junket to allow wives and the few husbands to go shopping in London and have, you know, fun little outings and it's spending thousands of pounds of money that the church doesn't have to spend? And Justin said, you just don't understand that in the vast majority of the church, especially in Africa and Asia, the bishop's wife has a role almost as important as the bishop. Mm -hmm. Now that's not true in the United States. It's not true in England, but certainly in Africa. Uh, sometimes, you know, I see these things about the mama bishop and it bothers me because that's not how we do things in the United States, the bishop's wife. Okay, well, I'll give you the greatest example I can think of, Kwashis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the, the bishop is a wonderful bishop, and his wife has a wonderful, thriving ministry herself within this, the same province. So, you know, say what you will, in Africa, it works differently. And he, he went on to say that bringing the wives together is a way to affirm their ministries, mm -hmm. to be supported in this work, to hear how other people are doing it. Now, there will be... Uh, people who will basically see this as a junket and a fun little vacation. Um, but the vast majority of the Global South bishops whose wives, there are only 480 wives coming 586, 68. 100 wives won't be present, uh, or spouses, mm -hmm. husbands and wives. The um, vast majority of the Global South ones have a ministry in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. um, there's a uh, we discussed and you know 
here's how different it is. You know, there's one Canadian suffragan who's in a same-sex marriage. His spouse, a suffragan in Toronto, is not even a Christian. Um, bringing, if well be allowed, the gay spouses, partner spouses, gay partner spouses to come, uh, that criticism would be justified because, you know, what is this person who's not even a Christian coming on the dime in the Canadian church to hobnob with other people? But then uh, you have, if you will, as you raise the example of Gloria Kawashi. Mm -hmm. So, but where I'm, so this, so I'm trying to impart to you the facts that were shared, but also the man I saw speaking. And the man I saw speaking, I have been very harshly critical of him for a very long time because he's disappointed me time and again. I think I understand him a little bit better and I don't want to excuse past mistakes. I think some things that I are weren't too wise, but I think he knows the good and is trying very hard to do it, but just doesn't seem to be able to have the, I'm going to use a vulgar expression. No, don't do it, no, no. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, do you know what to do it? <laughs> the cojones, I guess they call it in in uh, less obtuse fashion. But in this reality, and when it, we're at this level, at the Archbishop of Canterbury level, we have expectations because we've had some previous Archbishops of Canterbury's in the last fifty, yeah, seventy-five years who have put forward a force with which. Decisions were made, proclamations were made, re resolutions were made, and kept. That were like, well, can't we keep doing that here as Anglicans? And we have learned we can't. The The mechanism to, to keep and hold accountable the, ch the church greater, the church episcopate, the church itself, cannot be held accountable under the current Anglican structures. Something's got to change. But we've also had, Kevin, archbishops, so like... St. Thomas of Becket, who've been willing to be murdered on their cathedral no. stairs <laughs> for, and basically who overcome their, uh, you know, if you see the Richard Burton movie, yeah. uh, Peter O'Toole, yeah, Richard, yeah. you know, it was the, it was, uh, the conflict between going along with the society as it is, or being faithful to God as I know it to be. Mm -hmm. And very few of us start out on the right side and maintain that throughout our lives. And sometimes it comes late. Mm -hmm. And as that movie showed, it landed in martyrdom. Now, I don't expect Justin Mart uh, Welby to be martyred, uh, but you never know when the spirit will move in his heart. Um, or in the heart of the Anglican communion, or in the heart of the Catholic small C church. You know. See, what he, this something that I just thought of, and it really encourages me. Kevin, remember when we were at the primates meeting in Alexandria mm -hmm. and we were chatting with Henry Arambi, uh, who was the Archbishop of Kenya at the time, uh, one of the great Kenya, men of the early gay Afghan. Wasn't he Uganda? Well, you're right. I'm sorry. Not that... They all run together. I, have to, I have to know these things Ken, you know, to, to be a Ken, I'm giving old. producer. Henry Ar Arambi of Uganda yes. was saying, you know, I, we were saying to him, like, what do you really want to see happen? What do you really want to see? And he said, you know, I really want to have a gathering of bishops, including Gene Robinson, where we spend two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten weeks, as long as it takes to talk this out. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a Vatican Council type thing, not where we're there for ten days, but we're there for months. Uh, not, not everybody can do that, but basically have a face-to-face -face so that we can see and hear and test these things through the spirit, through conversation, through dialogue. And Henry Arambi is confident that the Holy Spirit will convince the hearts of those uh, who have adopted ways not of the Lord to repent and come around. Mm -hmm. And in some respects, I feel that Justin Welby wants that too, but he's tied into the English system so tightly that I, he can't see a way out. And we got 10 days to do this, and we've got to have these reports and have these picture shows and talk about mosquito nets and all this and that. And as Gavin had, Gavin Ashton had said many times, being English just adds red tape to your life. 
Mm-hmm. You know, because you, you you're not allowed to communicate in, a, in an offensive manner. You have to speak in you know in, in the English ease of, of ways, and um, it just well we'll have to see. Do keep Lambeth Conference in your prayers. Yes, many people aren't attending. Um, keep Justin Welby and the leadership there in your prayers, but pray that this is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to to offer conviction, enlightenment in a day and age where people are are turning to the church and the church has no answer. What about this? No, well, we don't know. Is that really what the church is for? Is that what men and women had martyred themselves for centuries uh, to have the church without answers? Is that what Jesus, you know, hung from a cross so the church would have no answers? I don't think so. Let's move on. We'll talk more about that. You're going to have a story on the, uh, the presser? Coming up soon. Oh yeah, I've had several up so far. There'll be mm-hmm. four or five by the time I'm done. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I find people don't read past paragraph four or five on the internet, <laughs> so I've got to basically give it give it to you in bites, baby bites. I was looking at the stats on Anglican Unscripted. I and from time to time, like once every six months, I went, what's going on with our audience? There are about forty or fifty viewers who watched the entire episode twice. I don't know. It could be happening at an IP address. It's at a church. And so it's, it's the same IP address repeating. So it's it's two workstations at a church. It could be uh, um, the husband watches it at one time, the wife watches it at another. Don't know. But there's there's IP addresses. Could be, but... could be, the, yeah. could be the defamation lawyers right, yes, watching right. it closely. Oh, yes. Did he really say that? <laughs> It's certainly defamation learn. Certainly, people who are paid to watch us, you know, and I, we said this about our, uh, episode four hundred. We acknowledge as people who are paid to have to watch this, and we do feel sorry for you. If you, this is a place you, you you have to come and you have to get it to really understand unscripted. And if you're working for Lambeth and oh my God, I have to take notes on unscripted. I, I get it. We feel sorry for you. You, you have our sympathy. And so there's about 30, 20 to 30 people who watch it more than once. There's about another 5 to 10% who just click through and watch uh, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds all the way through um, and probably watch a, a total of uh, 10% of each episode. There is an inordinate amount of people, and I was talking to David Old about this about t- uh, seven years ago when I showed him the stats. He goes, why do so many people watch from start to finish? Yeah, you have like a 90% total engagement. I don't know. All I can think of is people click on it, start watching, get distracted, walk in the other room, go grab a coffee, whatever, come back. Oh, we're still on. That's why we have such great statistics is because, you know, something's happening that, you know, or they like the program. There's there's probably people out there. Tell me, are you the type of person who skips through or watches the whole program? Uh, leave a comment. Uh, you, you could say entire or skipper. Uh, to identify yourself uh we got a couple more things to talk about uh, i'm getting text for the wife are you done recording it are you done recording it so we need to hurry on here um another uh, english story a bishop in england has changed the baptismal uh liturgy to include uh, understanding of the baptisms baptized role in climate change and we got to talk about that george Stephen Croft, the Bishop of Oxford, on June 11th in his diocesan synod address, spoke at great length about the climate crisis. He's in the House of Lords Select Committee on Environment and Climate Change. And he talked about uh, all the things the diocese needs to do to fight climate change. They're going to spend 10 million pounds to fix up rectories so that by 2035, uh, they're carbon neutral, meaning that... uh, I don't know how they're going to do that, but uh, they, they don't uh, use more than uh, they can produce from uh, green renewable energy sources. And he said, and he encouraged people to recycle well, that, all the usual stuff. But then he gets down towards the end of his uh, uh, speech and he says he's authorized to change to the baptismal liturgy. The Church of England's baptismal liturgy consists of five questions and many of them, I think, will be familiar to people. Let me pull it up because this is really important. Um, you know, the first question is, will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in the prayers? 
And the newly baptized or the godparents say, with the help of God, I will. Mm -hmm. Will you per per persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? With the help of God, I will. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of Christ, God in Christ? With the help of God, I will. Will you seek and serve Christ and all people, loving your neighbors yourself? With the help of God, I will. Will you acknowledge Christ's authority over human society by the prayer for the world and its leaders, by defending the weak and seeking peace and justice? With the help of God, I will. Various formula, you know, there are five questions. We have something similar in the Episcopal Absolutely. baptismal liturgy. There's something mm -hmm. similar in the ACNA baptismal liturgy. Mm -hmm. Well, Bishop Stephen Croft says under Canon B5, he is adding a sixth question. I will read it to you. Oh, will you strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth? With the help of God, I will. If you are going to be baptized in the Diocese of Oxford, you have to be a greeny weeny because it's now been added to the baptismal liturgy. Now, this is remarkable, Kevin, and it's not gone down very well. Uh, outside of the environmental uh, tree-hugging community. I can think of liberal bishops and clergy who would be extremely upset with that. You can't, you know, even pro-climate change, or pro-climate, pro-greedy-weeny uh, bishops would not like that. That's, that's well, a step too far. Well, Greenpeace put out a statement saying, finally, you guys got it. It's wonderful. It's great. You really now am addressing the important things. Forget sin. Forget renouncing the devil. Forget all that stuff, you know. Hug a tree, you know, tree. give a hoop, don't pollute, never the be a dirty bird, said yeah. Woodsy L. Mm -hmm. and, but also I was surprised to see some of the responses on Twitter. Uh, Marcus Walker is the rector of Great St. Great Saint Bartholomew in London. He's one of the co-leaders of the Save the Parish. He's sort of a liberal Catholic. And he's saying, this is really, 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 I don't know how many reallys, but bad. <laughs> Diocese of Oxford. What other contemporary political issue will people be forced to swear on to sign on to in order to be baptized in Oxford? Somebody else wrote uh, Robert Thompson, another London vicar in uh, West Hampstead, had a tweet saying, you know, this is this this the Catholic creed and the, the it's just being trivialized. That's my word. Uh, just, you know, uh, what? He said, uh, but to add as a sort of baptismal promise constitutes an attack on the Catholic and creedal nature of the church. These are liberals, and they're absolutely right. This addition of a political language, politicized language, I think is a very, very bad move. But well, they're already using it in uh, baptismal services in the Diocese of Oxford. I could see a time in the near future... Uh, certainly here in America, maybe not so much in other parts of the, the world, where there is an S, you ascribe to some type of LGTBQ within the baptismal covenant. Um, here in America, uh, this Pride Month has been really hard to watch. Uh, and uh, um, you, the, you almost can't participate in commerce unless you have a, a pride flag or a pride shirt here this and i'm speaking from madison wisconsin but uh it's just where does that stop if you're going to do it for the earth can't we do it for uh love is love well you understand well, that here, love is love kevin in our part of florida we live by the three g's the three g's that guide people's daily lives god guns and genealogy they're the three things that keep old people busy <laughs> what if i uh you know what if we had what if we had a Second Amendment gun crazy chip parish, gun happy parish that said, you know, and we support the right to bear arms and we will defend the right to bear arms and mm -hmm. because this is God's way. It's another politicalized thing. I mean, uh, is, yeah. or to add, oh, in this ab abortion thing, somebody was passing around four or five Episcopal clergy, not jobs a lot, were plus passing around this lament in the expectation of the failure of Roe versus Wade. And my God, these people, you know, have put to prayers that, you know, God is being mocked by 
uh, getting rid of abortion on demand. You know, remember, remember the head of the abortion uh, is a blessing. Yeah, uh, it's a sacrament. This one Episcopal priest priest was saying this woman. You know, imagine if those things now are added into the baptismal creed because you really, 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 really believe it. Therefore, others have to also. That's a bad idea. Well, I've said, you know, for years now that abortion is the Eucharist of feminism. You know, it, it is, you know, their ultimate revelation that they can do something a man can't do. You know, that, that, that takes us beyond equality, uh, beyond equity, beyond everything. Here's something we can do uh, to our bodies that you can't do. We can control life. And woof, that's a Eucharist. And we don't have that right now in, in America uh, at, a, at a national level, but we'll have to see what happens. Uh, you, anything else we need to talk about? You had a couple more stories. I've run out of my no, outline, so we have... Well, let me don't, check keep, it. don't keep till Tuesday. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, we're at 57 minutes. And 57 minutes in, for two 50-year-olds, the bladder's calling. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 738 of Anglican Unscripted.